Thank you very much, Barry, for that very kind introduction. What an extraordinary year it has been, um, and, and particularly for myself. Um, working with Aaron over the last sort of 13 months has been quite an experience. Um, if you haven't uh, heard of it or seen it, we, uh, Aaron has just written a book uh, called The Bad Boys of Brexit. Um, put it on your Christmas list. I'm going to reflect this afternoon on um, uh, how we got to where we are today, and then also the risks and the opportunities going forward. Now, believe it or not, I'm actually quite grateful to David Cameron for two reasons. Firstly, for giving us the referendum in the first place, even if there's some doubt whether he actually ever thought he would have to implement it. The second reason is that actually he managed, he basically managed to completely mess up the very, very good set of hands he had, uh, the very good set of cards he had in his hand. I mean, as John said, the renegotiation was an utter, utter shambles. And he then proceeded, I was actually quite grateful, that he tried to scare and frighten what I believe are the bravest and proudest voters in the world. And frankly, we weren't having it. That's where my gratitude ends. <laughs> because his refusal to allow any Plan B preparation was not only negligent, but it also meant that for a couple of weeks after the 23rd of June, we Leave voters were made to feel guilty about having exercised our democratic right. There was a total vacuum of leadership and planning, and we're not very good at that in this country. In other countries in Europe, they're quite used to it, um, but we're not. And so, you know, I think that was deeply shocking. And then, of course, you know, his, his refusal to allow this, of course, you know, irritating and frustrating. It was slightly disappointing, however, that whilst he didn't have a plan B, it's pretty clear that Boris and Gove didn't have a plan A. <laughs> this, this would never have happened in the world of business. Now, soon after the referendum, it was clear from all the whinging of the grumpy Ramones that actually... We had won the battle, but we hadn't won the war. And what's happened this week makes that ever more clear. And that's why a few of us Brexiteers, we got together and we set up a new campaign called Leave Means Leave, and I'm the co-chair of that, with the very brave John Longworth, the former Director General of the British Chambers of Commerce, who was ousted by Number 10 back in March or April. You really should hear his story about what went on. It's an absolute disgrace. Now, that brings me on to the risks and opportunities going forwards. Well, there are two areas of, of key risks out there. Firstly, as we're seeing at the moment, it's the behaviour of these Remainers. Led by the ever-popular Tony Blair, Nick Clegg, <laughs> coupled with the slightly noisy Anna Subri and Nicky Morgan. <laughs> They're the band of metropolitan elite who rarely go outside the M25, even less rarely speak to people who might live out there. And they don't believe in the word democracy unless it evokes their way. Let's be very clear what they're trying to do. They are trying to subvert, delay and deny the will of the people. They're using the courts, parliament and a very complicit broadcast media to suit their ends. The law ruling this week was frankly a charade by a very small, rich, powerful group around the legal system, and they are playing technical, technical games with the democratic will of the people. <laughs> now, frankly, they've had their fun. They should now withdraw, but of course they won't. Now, what they're doing, they're damaging our national interest. They're damaging our negotiating position with the European Union, and they're damaging our standing and credibility with other countries around the world. People now don't know whether we're leaving, staying, or as someone said earlier, doing a hokey cokey. You know, and it's disgraceful. What they're actually doing, they're betraying the national interest, when what they should be doing is supporting our country, supporting our Prime Minister, and getting behind the huge opportunities that Brexit can provide. Now, we are in a bit of a pickle as we stand here or sit here today. And the best response of the Prime Minister would actually be 
to take the initiative back. So what she should do, in my view, and I've been talking to some Tory MPs about this, is she should, she should have a debate in Parliament on Article 50 in the next couple of weeks. Let's cut the legs off this Supreme Court case, frankly, before it runs and runs. We can't wait another five weeks and then another few weeks after that. You know, her authority will wane and people's confidence and morale will sap. She can simply say, look, we agree to disagree, but let's have this debate in Parliament and let's introduce, as someone said earlier, a very simple one-line bill. We, the MPs, support the will of the people in leaving the European Union, and the only way to do that is to serve Article 50, and the government should be authorised to do so. She'd win that, and she would take back control of the initiative. And that's absolutely vital. I, I, you know, I think if she, if she leaves it and tries to run it uh, until post the Supreme Court, I think that would be very damaging to her authority. And my view is we should work on the default case, which is that we'll lose the Supreme Court decision. And then where we'll be? She'll be back in the same place, which is having a debate in Parliament. So she might as well get on with it. The truth is, economies are built on confidence, and I'm sure Patrick would agree. Investors, businesses, and consumers alike, they all want a bit of certainty so that they can plan. And what I've been very struck by in the months after the election, most, many senior business people, particularly in my industry, real estate, actually were Remainers. And I respect their decision. But what was great to hear from them was, right, we've made the decision, now let's get on with it. Let's have some confidence, because that's what people want. They want to know. They want to plan and know what they're, uh, what they're faced with. And actually, as Patrick said earlier, the default option is WTO. But if there's doubt creeping in, confidence falls, and then growth stalls, and economies weaken. And we've been doing so well, not to our surprise, but maybe to the Remainers' surprise, we've been doing so well since the referendum. So that's the first key risk. Now, the second key risk, I'm afraid, is a bit technical, but I'm going to say it anyway because I think it's absolutely crucial that the more people that understand this, the better. There is a major, major problem in the continental European banking system. It's far worse than any of us have been told. You'll remember the discussions about uh, Deutsche Bank about five or six weeks ago. I am, ladies and gentlemen, I mean, this situation could implode on us any month now. I'm one of the very sad people who has actually been through the 448-page uh, annual report and accounts of Deutsche Bank. If it were in a bookshop, I would suggest you go to the department marked fiction. <laughs> its debts and liabilities are about 1.6 trillion. Now, Patrick was worried about talking about billions earlier. How on earth, if you're a director of a business, can you count up trillions? Those debts and liabilities are 100 times its current market value on the stock market. And that market value is barely more, barely more than the level of the fine imposed by the US government on Deutsche Bank just recently. And yet Deutsche Bank have only provided about a third of it. I'm told the government wanted to get their, uh, their sort of their fine in early to get on the unsecured creditors list. You know, it's pretty scary stuff. Now, none of us here are great fans of the IMF, but I do think occasionally, just occasionally, it's worth listening to them. And what they said in August was that the greatest risk to the global financial system was the Deutsche Bank balance sheet. Now, let's hope that our beloved Angela Merkel, unlike Mr Cameron, has got a plan B for a bailout. Because if not, we all know, markets move faster than politicians. And the moment the market loses confidence in Deutsche Bank, I mean, it will disappear in about three weeks. Disappear in about three weeks. And the first thing the market will do is short all of the Italian banks, which have, are also in an enormous pickle. You may have read about that they've got a sort of capital shortfall of 50 billion euros. Forget it. It's somewhere between 150 and 200 billion euros. They simply haven't addressed their bad loans uh, crisis, and it is very scary indeed. Now, this may surprise you, but
But I think our government should seriously be prepared for this and should actually be willing, should be willing to contribute to such a bailout. Because actually what it would show is that whilst we might be leaving the bureaucratic European Union, actually we are still and always will be true friends and partners of our European neighbours. And if this problem occurred in the next few months, then actually it would give us hugely the moral high ground in our negotiating strategy. So I think that is potentially very important. Now, you can see what's up. Let's hope the situation doesn't happen, but you know, they are just kicking the can down the road. And how long can you do that before eventually it bubbles up? Now, if this scenario plays out in the next few months, before we serve Article 50, you know what all the, domestic, all the global institutions and leaders are going to say, don't you? Oh, please don't serve Article 50. It'll destabilise the system even more. We've got to be prepared for this, and we've got to be prepared to face it down. So that's, one of the, that's another key reason why it is critical that the government serves Article 50, in my view, very, very early in the new year. And it must clarify there and there, actually, that we're going to need not only the European Union, but all of its component parts, as Patrick and John said earlier. Now, we at Leave Means Leave, we've produced recently three reports on the single market, financial services, and going global. We all know that we must leave the customs union, otherwise there's no point in Liam Fox's department, because we can't negotiate free trade agreements with other countries around the world. And then let's take the single market. Well, the truth is, despite the myths that politicians perpetuate, the truth is it's actually been an incredibly bad deal for the UK. The maths are very simple. It costs us, give or take, a net £10 billion a year. I use the word net because some people get confused between gross and net. Um, but, um, uh, so we're, we're contributing about £10 billion a year and we're losing trade of, give or take, £100 billion a year. You don't need to be a rocket scientist to work out that that is a bad deal. It's interesting, isn't it? We have a deficit with the European Union of almost 90 billion every year in goods. And yet, with the US, with whom we don't have a trade agreement, we have a surplus in goods of about 10 billion a year. And in services, our surplus with the United States and the Americas is about 50% bigger than it is with the European Union. And Patrick touched on this earlier. So, you know, we don't need the single market or the internal market. It's actually been a bad deal for us. Now, John quite rightly touched on financial services earlier, and I'll just add with a couple of extra statistics. Passporting is massively overstated. It only came out recently that about 2,500 more EU companies have passports into the UK than our firms have passports into the EU. What also came out was that actually you don't just have one passport and sort of you know, just trade as we walk through uh, customs. No, no, no. The average UK firm has 62 different passports. That doesn't sound like a simple, single solution to me. That sounds like a bureaucratic, regulatory nightmare. So we can strip away, when we leave uh, the single market, we can strip away millions and millions of pounds of unnecessary compliance, and we can reduce the cost of capital. The truth is that if there was no form of agreement on passporting or its potential replacement, what's called equivalents, then actually lots of EU companies will have to move their treasury departments to London because actually it's, where it's in London that they can access the deeper, more liquid and much cheaper sources of capital, both debt and equity. That's the truth. And, and finally, there's lots of talk about the city and its people. I mean, for heaven's sake, they're some of the smartest people in the country. Surprise, surprise, they're already working out how to get around these issues. They're rapidly brass-plating all over the EU Frankly, look, they'll look after themselves. They always have done. We shouldn't worry about them. What we should be doing is getting much more excited about the opportunities out there post-Brexit. There's far too much focus on the problems and not on the wonderful potential that we have. We should let the government know, uh, we should let the EU know that we don't need a deal. At Leave Means Leave, we have a very simple mantra. Most business people know this. No deal is better than a bad deal. Sadly, too many politicians are not business-minded, and they don't understand that. 
And as Patrick said earlier, the WTO is fine, thanks. And we should use that as our default basis. Because not only would that show the EU that they've got just two years to reach an agreement with us, because we're off. Yeah. So that gives a very clear uh, starting point. But it also incentivizes and motivates the non-EU countries, about a two dozen of whom have reportedly already expressed an interest in a new trade agreement, that actually they can see tangibly the end date when we can sign. So they can negotiate with us now, and they are allowed to, get a draft agreement already, and then two years plus a day after Article 50, we should have a party, what I call a global FTA signing day. <laughs> and wouldn't it be wonderful, ladies and gentlemen, if that signing ceremony was on a brand new Royal Yacht Britannia made by British manufacturers <laughs> with British components. <laughs> Think how excited and positive that would be yeah. for everybody. The other big opportunity out there is the one that I hope the Chancellor will take very soon, which is to announce that he's going to bring down our corporation tax, not from 17% in 2020, but down to 15%. Because at that level, people could clearly see we could become a sort of, you know, a nicer Singapore of the West. Lowly taxed, sensibly regulated, and it would be absolutely fantastic. The extra growth would pay for itself very, very quickly. The truth is what would happen is global corporates would be banging down our door to locate their headquarters here. Most of them would say, at 15%, frankly, it's not worth bothering with offshore tax avoidance. Let's just go onshore, let's go to the UK, and let's make it work. We could even then be a bit more sophisticated, and to, to help the Prime Minister, as she said, you know, she should govern for the many, not the few, you could look at regionalising corporation tax, so that in Scotland, Northern Ireland, and Wales, you could have an even lower rate, so that companies would locate their headquarters there. And in parallel we need to be much, much more focused on the opportunity to invest in training and educating our people. The truth is it's been far too easy for big corporates and business people to say, oh, I can't find the skills locally, I've got to go overseas. What they used to do 30 or 40 years ago was have apprenticeships, training schemes, and it's been far too easy for them not to bother with those, but just to go overseas. I take the point that John quite rightly made earlier in terms of, of low-skilled, but there were things like the Seasonal Workers Agricultural Scheme that actually work, worked with that and dealt with that, I believe, very satisfactorily. And then the other opportunity is just to remove so many rules and regulations. And every industry should be planning now with their lobby groups, their associations, working out what they want, because believe it or not, there is some good EU law, and what they want to get rid of and then lobby the government to change these rules. And they should be doing this now, so that in two years' time, or two years and a bit, when we leave, the government is immediately changing the rules. In my industry, real estate, for example, there's a dreadful thing called the OGU procurement process, which just adds costs to bidding for construction contracts and timescales. And we could do away with that and cut those costs and make things more viable. So I'm quite also, I'm excited by the opportunity to say to our civil servants and our MPs, no longer can you say, oh, I agree with you, but sorry, there's nothing I can do, it's Brussels' fault. They can no longer say that. We can hold them accountable to perform in our best interests. Yeah. So, I mean, to conclude, there is all sorts of reasons, actually, despite all the nonsense this week, there's all sorts of reasons to be incredibly excited. My glass is always half full, it's never half empty. Yes, there'll be bumps in the road, but come on, let's just ride over them. Let's find solutions, not problems, ladies and gentlemen. And finally, let's think Churchill, not Chamberlain. <laughs> so, so all of us, with our friends and whatever possible ways we can, let's help ensure, ladies and gentlemen, that leave means leave and soon. Thank you very much.